Hi there and welcome to another episode of Ronan Nazarin Talks and today we're going to talk about a very important director, didn't have a huge body of work um, but his his legacy remains um, and that's Sergio Leone. Um, I'm Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films. And I'm the other one. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First thing first, you'll see we've set it up a bit more now. We're actually using NDI now, so we're actually getting there. All we need now is we get a light, so you can see my face pristinely. <laughs> yes, it only took us 18 months, but we're getting there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we had to just tape up everything. Rome Slowly. wasn't built in a day, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, and um, by, by, by the time we're perfect, we'll get banned from YouTube, just to make it, to give it uh, the finality. Yes, for mentioning Salo too many times. Yeah, but... As I was point out, on the plus side, we're, we're a lot more regular on the Folgers boys. Yes. Yes. So, we may as well as slag them off a little bit before we start. As always that. Yeah. yeah. And we blame Isaac for that, by the way. Because, <laughs> well, apart from poor Des Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm hoping he's annoyed now. <laughs> right, we're going to the proper thing then. <laughs> yes. Um... Sergio Leone was um, born into a mother and father who were in the industry. His mother was an actress. A mother and father? Yes, mother and father. Yeah, the way he said it, you... was like, yeah, well, I would assume so. <laughs> yes. Um, he started off working as assistants and then assistant director on American um, projects, including Ben-Hur. Yeah. Um, and then he directed his first film, which was Colossus and Rhodes, which I've never seen which was one of the many Sword and Sandals films that were popular at the time. I've never seen it either. It's like, yeah, I don't... I don't know if I his first it. film, but I don't even think about it, really. Um, and then, obviously, his first film was... Well, his first film that we kind of recognise him with was The Fistful of Dollars, um, which wasn't the first Spaghetti Western. There was 10 or 15 before that, but certainly the one that put the whole Spaghetti Western thing on the map. Yeah, it's kind of like what... Halloween was in the 70s too like the independent horror film the one that perfected it and yeah. set it up for what would follow it was just that explosion that we get it was like oh yeah. that's how you do it so like I said he obviously didn't make a lot of films sadly he died at the age of 60 um, but the six films that he made um, are fairly spectacular yes and I watched every one of them I hadn't seen them for ages, so this is a good excuse for me to watch them all again because I literally had had them in Blu-ray and I don't think I'd watched them since I got them in Blu-ray. And this was years and years ago because I said the fist full of the trilogy, the yeah. trilogy, was one of the first things I bought in Blu-ray, really. Yeah. And that was like in 2010, so it's been a while since I've really been watching things. So, uh, I mean, for me, I just kind of revisited the first couple of Dollars films because there's a couple of films that I've seen probably way too many times. Because um, certainly one of his films, The Good, The Bad and the Ugly, was one of those films that I loved before I really was into cinema or knew what cinema was. Um, I must have seen that probably way too many times even before I was into cinema. It just had a effect on me. Yeah, a strange effect. A strange effect, yeah, yes. That's why you are the way you are, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you, call, you see everyone to hey Blondie to everybody. Is that why you did? Yes, that's one of the many reasons to say yes. that. Yeah. Um, uh, but as a mark of how great he is, you know, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly for a long time was like my favourite, one of my favourite films of all time. And he still trumped that with one of his other films. Yes. And uh, for me, the first one I really saw was actually Once Upon a Time in America. So I started the end. That was one of the first yeah. ones I saw. It was 17 it came out in... Uh, in VHS, the original four version, and I just was like, oh, What the hell is that? And I just bought it, and I was like, This yeah. is amazing. And then I swore back. I think I may have seen Fistful of Dollars before that, but th- that was the film that got me, it was the one part time in America. Yeah. Yeah. So I Whichever was, version you saw. The four Because obviously it took a while, even from television, to actually get the proper version. 
Yeah, I've never actually seen the short version. I just never bought it. What was the point? Yeah. Because I remember they finally showed um, the full version, but it was over two nights for some reason. They split it in half. Yeah, it's weird. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, Sergio Leone just made masterpieces after masterpieces, the big thing. He, he was like um, one of the most consistent directors, really. Yeah, he was obviously completely different, but similar to Tarkovsky. They didn't make that many films, but like a burning comet, the films that they did make are pretty amazing. So we're we'll starting the individual films then, since we've talked about what influences, what were the ones yes. that got us. Um, now, Fist for Dolls is a homage, is the best way to put it, to uh, yes, <laughs> Ujimbo. Kudos, I didn't think that, but never mind. Yeah, I, it took me years to see Ujimbo. I mean, I never saw Ujimbo for years. To me, it was uh, Fist for Dolls. And then I saw the next remake, which was Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis and yes. Chris Walken. I walked the hell which... joint. Yes, Walter Hill always said you're an idiot if you remake Kurosawa. This was right after he'd made <laughs> Last Man Standing. So yeah, it was, um, was self depreciating about it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I, I still quite like a lot of Walter Hill 90s films. There was some sure. good stuff like Geronimo and Trespass and stuff and World Bill. Yeah. This was not one of them. <laughs> this was no. his uh, What the Hell Are You Doing type of movies. Not even Christopher Walken can save it, but I mean. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was quite a mess. But the film that was not a mess was A Fistful of Dollars. This is this surprised me when we watched it because I always thought that, I always knew this was, for me, the weakest of the Leone films for me. And it kind of still is, but it's so much better than I remember being. Because it is much more of a pace. There was so much stuff I remembered as I was watching it, and it was like, this is really good. This is superb. So much of this is just stunning. Yeah, I mean, I obviously I saw Yojimbo first, so I always have kind of Yojimbo bias against a fistful of dollars. But I watched it again. It's still like a four star film. Um, it, Leone has added a few bits that aren't in Yojimbo. Yeah. Um, to be fair, you know Kurosawa liked a uh, fistful of dollars, um, but he also said that's my film, and there was a legal thing. Yeah. Kurosawa ended up getting the Far East rights to a fistful of dollars, and interestingly, he made more money from that than any one of his single films. <laughs> so he did all right out of a fistful of dollars. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's the film of Leone's that I watch the least, because um, if I want to see that story, I watch Jimbo. but it's still a four-star film. I mean, yeah. it's still very, very good. Should we have a teacher saying Jimbo bias? Yeah, I mean, I'm... I hold my hands up. I'm guilty of your Jimbo bias when it comes to Fistful of Dollars. But it's still a very good film. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I've only, I only saw Jimbo about three years ago. It was one of those films of Kurosawa that yeah. it was hard to get hold of, but I just never found a good copy of it. It was like, I think I could only find the copies from Asia that was like, and they one of the ones that were really crappy looking. Yeah. So, I, I, Jimbo's I, been in my life for a long time, so. Yeah. But, um, yeah, for me, it was always Fistful of Dollars. But the thing that... Yujimbo's a better film. Yujimbo yeah. is actually a better film. It's... Clint Eastwood's good as the lead, but Mifune is great as the lead than Yujimbo. Yeah. And it's just darker and funnier, and the subtext with a lot of the... I'm facing off against people and him dealing with the families and saving people... I think it worked better in Jimbo than it does in Fistful of Dollars. The bit that I think yeah. doesn't work as well in Fistful of Dollars but Clint Eastwood saves the family and it feels a bit the, weak, like the weakest part was like I don't quite buy it as much as... Yeah, because you, you, know, you hear a bit of his motivation oh, I knew somebody once that was in that situation whereas in your Jimbo there's no reason for it. The whole thing is he just does it because he's bored which is kind of rare for... You know, a, a protagonist to do in a film. Yeah. There's no motivation. He's just got nothing else to do. Whereas, I mean, they wanted to cut that down in Fistful of Dolls, but they still have that bit about, oh yeah, I knew somebody once was in this yeah. situation. Whereas, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's a bit that just seems to be like, it, it's a bit you have to get through for the rest of the film. Because the rest of the film, it's really Volante versus Wood, and that's really there for those two yeah. going off 
you know, Clint Eastwood becoming a movie star, Volante being the great crazy villain. Yeah, and Volante's amazing in his films. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's kind of weird. It's like the first films of Volante, the second films, like uh, Lee Van Cleef, the third films, Eli Wallach, kind of weird way. It's like, yeah. and the weird thing about Eastwood is he's, as an actor, he actually seems to be always, even in American films, He's actually okay at letting another actor dominate and yeah. entertain people. He's like he doesn't seem to have that kind of actor like resentment or fear of someone upstaging yeah. him. He's just like he lets them do their thing. I think he somehow understood the image of his character was more important than what he was saying because I think he actually said he wanted less dialogue. And what leading actor says that in a film? Yeah, but I think he knows he's a straight man and. He needs another person to be the broad one, and it works. It just yeah. that's what works for him. And Leone was a guy who knew all the really interesting actors to place against him. But Volante is yeah. just like insane in this film. He's just so good. His introduction, we, we destroys all those troops. It's like yeah, ah, he's just amazing. And Clint Eastwood as he goes through the town and starts picking off and figuring out how to manipulate everybody. It's just amazing, just so wonderfully done. Yeah. I mean, Volante, apparently Leone, Volante always wanted to go bigger and bigger and Leone would like wear him out with multiple takes to actually try and get his performance down, especially in the second film. Yeah, but it's, it's a perfect mix of performances, though. Because, yeah. like, um, it, it's it's nice to set up as a time bomb before Volante appears, and then soon Volante appears, it becomes like, oh, this is out of control. This is... Yeah. This is like this is like a matchstick, and especially the bit where they start to the massacre the other town, the other group in the town. Yeah, it's a bit that's like that's brutal. That's really brutal for Western. That's really yeah, because that's why these films kind of got into trouble with the BBFC as well, because that kind of thing was never really seen in American westerns. The kind of enjoyment of the brutality. Um, because apparently it used to be you can see a gun shooting, you can see somebody fall over, but you didn't really see that in the same frame. Yeah. Whereas Leone didn't really know about these so-called rules, yeah. so he would just like have. Yeah, it's more interesting you know, to do it that way. And stuff. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, and it's also just fun to watch Eastwood just walk through the terrain and just yeah. deal with things because he just tells comfortably, he understands the film he's in. It's like yeah. instant actors kind of found. What they're good at, what that's their thing is to be understated, to be wry and be amused by the way life goes, you know, yeah. which just works. Because Cause he was, you know, he was desperate for a job, so they only, he only got fifteen grand for a fistful of dollars because yeah. all the other actors that they wanted was were too expensive. So yeah, the thing is, he just he wanted the work. Yeah, if he wanted to work, he wanted a holiday, and he was like, "I'll go and do this and go to Spain for a bit." And it literally changed his life. Yeah, and, and he's so good in it. And he's just like so relaxed. Maybe because he didn't take that seriously, it helped him to understand what how the pace to play at. And he just yeah was perfect for that. And just the amusement he had over all the overacting around him just really worked. Just like yeah, and I liked his relationship with the the guy who ran the hotel. Yeah, that's a really nice kind of relationship that each would seem to pick up in these films. Just as this, like, um, this situation's bad. Let's let's be amused by some of the bizarreness that we're seeing. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun little film. Yeah, and it's it's a massive black comedy as well. I mean, it's a hilariously yeah. funny film. But so is Jim. Jim was really funny as yeah. well. I mean, it's like both. Like, I think that's the key to this kind of film is you need to have a sense of humour. You need to yes. be... It's... It's overdone. It's intentionally overdone. You need to know you're overdoing it. You're... That's the... It's an opera. Like, yes. Leone does operas. I mean, the early skirmish with how many coffins you're going to need. Yeah. It's, like, wonderful in both films. Yeah, and it just becomes this kind of thing. Like, uh, Leone really loves that kind of stuff, like the morbidity that just seems to get more and more pronounced as he goes on. He's just like, um, yeah, that's of humour. He's got a thing for graveyards and corpses and 
yeah. obviously crosses everywhere and churches and yeah, we're Italian, so what do you expect? Yeah, plus the whole Catholic things going. Plus having shootouts in graveyard is just perfect. It's like oh, that's yeah. not going anyway. They cut the middle man. They just have them shot there and left there. It's just and obviously the coffin maker making all these coffins. It's like who's paying for all these funerals? It's just like <laughs> he's so happy because he's. I think he just reads the bodies and takes yeah. what's there, and that's. And it's almost like they, they let him do it. It's like, well, okay, I guess that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> he buries them. He takes the money off them. That's yeah. It's just a wonderful film. It's. In a weird way, it's sad because the other films were so good that it's kind of underrated. Yeah. Because it's not the one you jump to when you're going to watch one of these films unless you're going to do them in order. But it is such a good film. But yes. unfortunately, it's a remake of an even better film, which makes it harder to... It's like... Yeah. It's easier to underrate. So, Fistful of Dollars was 1964. was a huge hit. Um, and then the sequel came out in 65. Um, yeah, because the first kind of clump of Leone films are like fairly um, rat tat at tat one after the other. Um, yeah. So a few lazy. dollars... They get really lazy. Yeah. So a few dollars more is bigger, a bigger budget, um, a better cast, you would say, um, and just a bigger story, yeah. and it's a better film. Yeah. I should say here, this is my favourite Leone film. It's not the best Leone film, it's just my favourite... You know, there is a difference. I, I, I can understand the other ones are better, but that's the one I really love, just emotionally. That's fair Because I love the Lee Van Cleef character and his story. I just think it's a wonderful yeah. thing that really brings it out. Plus, Volante is even more over the top of this one. Yes, Volante is aided um, by chemicals, but he is completely mental in this. Yeah, I always feel he's smoking weed just to get the demons further down than it would be otherwise. I think with yeah. weed, he would be really insane yeah so this was the film that Leone really tried to get Volante's performance down so it's like you can't imagine what he was actually doing <laughs> if this is him subtle yeah well, I think Volante he, he's, he can be subtle in other films I think he just thought I'm in an opera I'm just going to go for it I'm in an yeah. absurd movie don't kid ourselves we're doing something really yeah. silly here and so this sorry sorry I'll let you go no, I was just going to say, so this was really Lee Van Cleef's first big role. I mean, he was obviously just the third baddie to the left for a long time in his career, but he just had one of those amazing faces, and he is just one of the coolest actors of all time. It's um, basically his film. Yeah. Really. I mean, and Leone, you know, they were trying to find an actor for this. There was Lee Marvin and other people, um, but when Leone kind of saw his face, remembered him, um, he just wanted him, and at the at the time, sadly, I mean, Lee Van Cleef was obviously looking for work and um, was a bit hard up. And this again revitalised his career because he then went on to play Sabata and many other uh, Italian and Spanish Western characters. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is, um, the actual character is pretty much um, the centre of the story. I mean, Clint Eastwood's yeah. basically the chief supporting actor in this film. Yeah, he's off to the side, really. He's a. Yeah, he like comes say, in and does things, character. but he's not the person driving it. It's Lee Van Cleef is Conor Mortimer, who's actually. Is it Conor Mortimer in this one? Yeah. Yeah. Because he plays different characters, so it's very confusing. Yeah. Um, and they're very different characters, so it's even more confusing. And it's such an assured performance for somebody that was always kind of a bit player. The fact that it's, like you say, it's pretty much his film, and it's just such a great performance. Yeah, because it's subtle and you really feel for him because he's, he's out for vengeance, but he's out for vengeance for justified reasons. Like, like Volante killed his sister and her husband in a really horrible way, and it's just like, yeah, you get it. You instantly get it. He's just yeah. he's going to take the guy out. That's it. That's all he's about. And it's just very emotional, especially because this is where Lodi just covered the flashback, how the flashback can be really emotional if you don't get all the story to start with, you just get bits of it and you slowly are waiting to find yeah. out what's going on. I mean, Leone, you could argue, is pretty much the best proponent of flashback and how to use it actually properly. People, yeah. A lot of people just don't know how to do flashbacks properly, and Leone kind of does that. Yeah, and pretty much his way of doing flashback became the way of doing a flashback in the Jello film in the seventies. They all just took looking at the ones that were doing bits. that. 
Yeah. You don't give everything away. Yeah. And, like, I mean, obviously, because uh, Argento worked with Leone, and then he went on to do all the ja- main giallos. I mean, he understood that. Yeah. It was like, well, that's how you do it. That's the technique. Yeah. But, but still yeah, today, people don't do it properly. I know. It's ridiculous. It's just an easy thing, because it has to tie to the emotion of the character. It has to tie to the emotion of the story. He just have to do it that way. That's just the way... Yeah. Uh, that's the, the part of the storytelling. And, of course, a lot of... Not necessarily censors, but when his films were cut down, a lot of the time they cut out the flashbacks. So, like, a lot of the time the films didn't make sense. It's just like... Yeah, so why are you doing this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. It's really weird. And um, this is where Leone started to find himself, I think, a lot more. Like, it was his own yeah. story. Like, he could do more. It was interesting to him. Like, he could actually set up the theatrical tropes that he was interested in in a way that the film... He could hint at them, but... It was a bit more yeah, a, fist, a fistful of dollars has those little kind of seeds of what would become Leone, but this is the first one that kind of had fully fledged Leone. Like the start of the film, it's like twenty minutes before the actual story starts. Yeah, which is wonderful in Leone, which um, yeah. lots of filmmakers could learn how to do that prop. Yeah, and you the bit with Eastwood and uh, Lee Van Cleef and the shooting the hats and things, and so yeah, it's like. It's perfect, but it's not to do the plot, but it tells you everything with the characters. It tells you yeah. everything you need to know. It's almost like a childish thing, but of course they're grown men with guns. I know. And um, how Eastwood's kind of always betraying Van Cleef, and Van Cleef always forgives him anyway. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. I it's mean, really funny. We'll probably get to it later, but the kind of relationship that Leone's male characters have with each other, that kind of respect but also they would quite happily kill each other if they had, if it had to yeah it's just wonderful which we'll get to probably in the next film yeah but i mean it's um it's just a really wonderful relationship though because um as it goes on once eastwood finds it why it's all happening he's a real respect for what's happening he yeah. doesn't like, once he knows what's going on he has respect for Okay, you can get as yeah, guy. It's, it's for you. It's it, I shouldn't be here. I'm, I'll stand aside and I'll make my money. Yeah, because it starts off obviously it's just two bounty hunters going after the same gang for money. But obviously, as we learn more about it, it obviously develops a more emotional core. Yeah, probably one of the more emotional cores in Leone films. Yeah, I think so. And of course, at least one of the best gags ever were. Um, I thought Eastwood is like, I thought I would trouble my counting. Yes. <laughs> it's one of the great lines, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just great. I mean, there's a great sense of humour, but it's also, there's a real pain to Lee Van Cleef's character, and you're just interested in watching them. But also, um, just watching Volante with all those other sickos as I try to rob this bank. Yeah. It's just. I mean, Klaus Kinski's in it. I know. Sake. Klaus Kinski's not even the craziest guy in it. As He's a hunchback. Just, <laughs> He's just this weird hunchback who gets killed as a side. Yeah. You know, like he's like the character Van Cleef would have played in another film. Yeah. But um, again, it kind of speaks to Leone's amazing gaggle of faces that he uses in his films. I mean, some of the faces that Leone managed to get from whatever leonecasting.com, I don't know. Um, the faces of the gang and just the faces that Leone uses in his films are just so much character and just amazing visually, especially on a big screen. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, just a lot of the stuff to do. But, um, the, uh, oops, sorry, Greenwich. <laughs> I'm very <probably> professional. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, the faces are amazing, but also the interactions. Like, um, where you see a guy in, Volante's gang that Eastwood you know is going to kill him at some point <laughs> and he just yeah. set up we're just waiting for the point where Eastwood kills him it's just like um, and you're just sort of waiting at the bank and I'm scoping the bank out and you're working out what they're going to do in the bank and and it's yeah. obvious Volante wants the bank passes for money but he just wants the bank he just wants to take yes. down the bank he wants the ego thing really and you've got all that stuff about the the, the what was in the in the bank and try to keep it and try to hide it and 
Yeah, the scene in the church where he's describing where the actual safe is and what is just wonderful. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and again, it's that kind of mix of like the holy and the profane. You know, it's just like yeah, it's so good. Plus, plus uh, Volante with the um, with the drugs, just the way he just sucks down him every possible chance. He just goes way yeah. over the top. Because I saw I love... Christopher Freeland say he didn't think that um, Looney knew what, what, how drugs worked. Probably didn't, oh. <laughs> but. His way of doing it actually can watch the character because, as I said earlier, you think that the weed's actually keeping Volante from being more insane. Yeah. There's just a weirdness to it that's just wonderful. And I bet mean, film was just talking about great moments from the film saying, This is great. That was great. That was great. Yeah. And obviously, we haven't even mentioned the Morricone stuff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> which is obviously mind blowingly amazing. Yeah. I mean, the. The thing is, when you first see the Dollars trilogy, when you first see the first the, the, the opening credits of anything, it's like, oh, this is something new. This is yeah. something. This is something special. Just instantly, they just get power and they've got confidence. It's like, yeah, we're doing something different. All this other stuff you're used to gets away. It's not here anymore. I mean, there's a reason why Leone stood out, and most people would agree he was the best director of quote-unquote spaghetti westerns which certainly Morricone hated that term it's just because he was so different and just so above everything else yeah and the the whole thing is just like wonderful when you watch them just the the atmosphere the music how it brings the drama and how it allows the only to actually slow the pace down and yeah and how just having Eastwood and Van Cleef walk just a slow walk can sort of be like an epic moment. They're walking slowly through a yeah. town, ready for a gunfight, and it's just like it's an epic moment. It's bigger than most moments from a movie with a hundred million dollar budget because this one has effect. It's yeah, like... I mean, Leone could elongate time. I mean, obviously the famous standoffs, which again you didn't see in American westerns. Yeah. American westerns, there was some dialogue and it was bang bang. Whereas Leone just stretched that out for theatre, stretched it out for myth building, yeah. elongated time, um, which just made it more theatrical, more operatic, yeah, um, and just even more amazing. Yeah, just wonderful stuff, just way over the top. And the, the, the funny thing is, um, Leone, I was talking about the hats. He was aware of how childish it all was as well. He was, yeah. he'd have a sense of humour about it. He was, it was just. Great. Yes, his westerns are about westerns as well as about other stuff, and his films are actually more political than people gave him credit for. Yeah, because I think a lot of Italian films were political, but they didn't understand the politics at the time. So if you're for an American critic trying to understand the politics of a spaghetti yeah. western, you're going to be confused because it had nothing to do with the politics of America at the time. It was something completely different. Yeah, a lot of them are about the relationship between Northern Italy and Southern Italy yeah. um, and how they feel about each other. Um, Which is not a healthy relationship. No. Um, but you, for a few dollars more, it's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's just, it's just awesome. That's, that's our five-star yeah, review. That's the take awesome. message. Right. And again, Maloney films see it on the biggest screen possible because that's what his films were made for. Good, the band, ugly... Which again was a year later, I believe, sixty six. Um, this was a film, like I said before, that I loved instantly when I saw it years ago. I saw it way too many times before I even was into films. Um, for a long time, it was my favourite western of all time. Or, yep, um, before it got usurped. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's another film, three characters this time rather than two um, from. A few dollars more. Again, it takes even longer to get the story started, but you don't care because you just love these characters and you want to see not their backstory, but their kind of introductions. And only Leone would spend like 40 minutes just introducing characters. Um, yeah. Again, the relationship between Lee Van Cleef, Eli Walk, and Clint Eastwood is one of the greatest relationships in cinema history as far as here's guys who would easily show each other without thinking, but obviously have this respect for each other as well. The whole masochism and sadism between the three as they're all trying to kill each other in various sick ways. 
it's epic in every sense of the word. It's just an amazing, amazing film. Morricone's score is just out of this world. So you like it then? I do like it. Yeah. This might be the film that I've seen the most of any film, I think. Yeah. This is the one film I've seen in the cinema from Leone. I saw this in the cinema and it looks amazing in the cinema. See, I've never seen it in the cinema. I've only seen it. I, I saw it in a film society showing there was a shouldn't this was shouldn't show and it was like I'm definitely not a chance to watch this film. So yeah. um it looks amazing in the cinema. Um but yeah, it is just a wonderful film. It really is. And um the fact that the story's not that important is actually makes it even better. It's just Yeah. It's about these three characters interacting. They're wanting the money, but the money's not really that important. It's like, well, they just want it because they want it. Yeah. But they're really having more fun messing with each other, especially Eastwood and Wallach. Who's... Yes, I mean, <laughs> the whole game of let's make money by getting you hung and then I'll shoot you just before you get hung. I mean, it's just like... It's sick, but it's so good. Yeah, so wonderful and just, just ridiculous. Just didn't see that in an American Western. You yeah, never saw all... that kind of sadism and just black, black humour. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's also the... Uh, the the way Eastwood just drops, essentially, at some point. Goes, you know, yeah. You're not going to make any more money for me. And then Walt goes for revenge, and that's another... For 40 minutes of film is Walt trying yeah, to revenge it's... for... Which has nothing slight. to do with the main plot. It's brilliant. Yeah. Eventually ties to the main plot, like, but now we're in. <laughs> yeah. Really. Eventually we get to a plot, and every so often Lee Van Cleef shows up at that point, getting information, which tells you there is, there's going to be a plot eventually. We're going to get yes. there eventually, but just hold off and we'll, we've got another 10 minutes of Warlock checking his gun and trying to work out his gun. And yeah. That's, um, and we've got a couple of minutes of Eastwood um, doing some little thing. And it's like, and loads and loads of dark humour. Just yeah. so much dark humour. And so cynical about the war and how useless it is, really. About how people are just yeah. profiteering off it. And, it's the uh, fact that Eastwood, you know, says he's never seen so much waste of life in yeah. his life before. And despite, so despite all the sadism and stuff. Because I think I did make a, a point when I was younger of, counting up who actually kills the more people. And, of course, it's Clint Eastwood, who's the good. He yeah. actually has the highest body count, which, <laughs> obviously... It's He's Leone. the best shot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but throughout all that, it's the kind of pointlessness of this battle for a bridge that even Eastwood, who's obviously a kind of jaded character, is like, this is just pathetic. It's such a waste of human life. Yeah, no, it's also Eastwood is... That's a joke, because he's the good. That's a big joke of the yeah. film. It's like, because he's obviously not... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Wallach's definitely ugly. He's definitely ugly. And yeah, and Van Lee Van Cleef is, is definitely is bad. Definitely bad. <laughs> but good. He um, no. He has never looked more wolfish than he does in this. Oh, yeah, he practically looks like a wolf. Yeah, he's pretty much the opposite of his character in the last movie. He is, yeah. you know, um, just a utter brute. He's just out for the money. He will do anything and kill anybody. And they, well, one of my favourite bits in the early part when he when he gets the the name from the family, kills them all, and then he goes back to the other guy that employed him. And yeah. he says, well, the third thing was I was to kill you. And I always... Uh, yeah. Once I've been followed, paid. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just enjoying it so much. He just shoots, puts the pill in front of him, just shoots him, and it's like, that's so cool. And so yeah. darkly funny. But again, it's something you probably never see in American Western. Yeah, I know, I mean, it's like, um... There's it's, such it's, a, a dark sadism throughout this film, but it's also fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is really the start of the anti-hero. The yeah. only really started the anti-hero, ultimately, is a fun character. I mean, it was anti-hero as a serious character before Leone, but he was one that made it fun, yeah. you know. And again... You know, it's not much of a stretch with the prison camp to look back at concentration camps, the whole, you know, band having to play while somebody gets tortured. More I mean, feeling. that's, yeah, <laughs> again, it's just like so dark. But again, that's kind of um, back to World War Two. You know, in Leone films, there's always stuff about 
people who collaborate, people who get tortured to find out information. You know, Clint Eastwood gets beaten up or tortured just about in all three of these films. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, apart from Van Cleef's character, he just says, uh, I'm not going to bother torturing you, I know you wouldn't speak anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure Leone was like coming out of another scene where Clint Eastwood gets beaten up. But. Yeah, maybe at least we were, Oh, after the epic desert scene, I think Eastwood had enough being up. Yes. I mean, that was uh, that was pretty brutal. And the, one of my favourite scenes is where now where the. Where, where, what catches him and he has to uh, try and hang him. Yeah. And uh, the, the room gets blown up and it's just like. <laughs> There's two types of spurs in the world those who <laughs> yeah. come in by the door and those who come in by the window. Yeah, uh, and Fantastic. here's also where Leone actually almost outdoes himself from the amazing scenes from Van Cleef and Eastwood walking just down the street. And then you have uh, Warlock and Eastwood walking down the street to take out Van Cleef's men two thirds of the way through. That's just an epic moment of yes, coolness, the, just utter then coolness. The, then the cannonballs go off. Yeah, and all, but also the thing is at the end where basically the ghost down the street, kill everybody, and then they reach Van Cleef and he's gone. He just let his men be killed for no reason. <laughs> yeah, and he leaves a note, and of course, the <laughs> L.I. Wallace trying to read it, and it's like... <laughs> yeah, you idiots. It's, it's, yeah, it's for you. It's yeah. for you, yeah. <laughs> but again, despite the, you know, Eastwood and Eli Wallace try and kill each other a few times in the early part of the film, but then when Eli Wallace goes after um, Angel Eyes, Lee Van Cleef, you know, Eastwood turns up and goes, what, are you going to die alone? So you've still got that, yes, we could shoot each other quite easily, but we're actually going to work together, which is just yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, know, I think it's a case of, they know you don't trust each other, but they trust him even less. Yeah. Like, there is enough respect between them. Like, they know they, don't, they can't trust each other totally, but they're not... By the end of it, Eastwood respects how much Eli Wallach went for the money, and he yeah. just gives them a... Respect of I don't trust you not to try and steal it all, but I'll find a way to let you have your money and let me have my money, and that's it. Yeah, and of course Eli Wallace is always confused about which side he stood on. It's like <laughs> yeah. are you working with him or are you working with me or are you working with him. Yeah, and Eastwood just smiles and just gives on it. Yeah, and there's also nice moments as you see Eastwood get his um, his clothes for other movies as he picks yes. up, he loses the jacket and he gets the poncho and it just slowly evolves. So it's quite a nice moment. Yeah. And of course, big joke is he always has to lose the money he gained after each film. Again, he's always getting the next film. So he's yeah. not very good at keeping it. He's good at making the money, but not keeping it. But I've always thought in these films, you know, they end up with bags of like gold. It's like, where are they going to put them? Because if they put them in banks, banks get robbed all the time. So it's like. I know, it's like. Um, it's <laughs> what absurdity. are you actually going to do with that money? <laughs> it's just absurdity. It's just one of those yeah. things. They're going to get robbed somewhere down the line again. And yeah. so it's like a case of well, what's the point? And, and um, it's, it's one of those films that has a finale and then it has another finale, but it works. Whereas yeah. there's other films that have finale and finale and you just go, oh, hurry up and end it. Yeah. Whereas The Good, The Bad and Ugly is one of those long films that feel short. Yeah. And that is a gift. And so many filmmakers could learn about that. Well, the thing, it varies the kind of scene it's in. Because it starts on one kind of scene, then it changes around. Even though it's a, basically a pursuit movie with Warlock and Eastwood and then dealing with Angel Eyes, they vary the kind of scene, the kind of jokes I'm having for each scene. So every, some yeah. scenes are faster, some scenes are slower, but they're always varying what's happening. So you're always interested. You're always going towards this mysterious future, yeah. not quite sure where it's going. So eventually when it slows down for the finale, you're, it's pretty satisfying because you've had a lot of great scenes before they get to the big duel where Eastwood yeah. took out uh, Wallace's bullets the night before and what does not know, <laughs> which is yeah. a great joke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously you have two of Morricone's finest bits of music, The Ecstasy of Gold, when Eli Wallach is going round in the graveyard. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like yeah, but the orgasmic they, camera work. They didn't have the cannon, though, where Eastwood just blows them up. So. Yeah. <laughs> Then of course that leads into the three-way standoff with the trio, the yeah. piece of music by Morricone, which is just amazing as well. Yeah, and who, again, who would build a graveyard though for a shootout? Yeah, <laughs> set up for a shootout. <laughs> Apparently that graveyard is still there, and people you can actually pay money to have a gravestone there, and wow. people look after it. 
and it's like it's a movie set. It's, yeah, it's still um, a place to visit. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, this one's just wonderful. This one's just a riot of fun the whole way through. Cause it yeah. pretty much is a full-on black comedy at this point. Yeah, they're really setting themselves up quite a bit, but it's not the seriousness because when you get to the bit where they're at the bridge, it's pretty serious how horrible this is and how. Yeah. Like um, even though you're you're with the blues and they are on the side of the good apparently historically, they're messed up and they don't care. They just want to get out of here. They just want to go yeah. and move on because it's about the point of view is the men fighting the war don't really care. They're just trying to survive it. They're just they're not idealists for either side. They're just trying to get on with surviving this horrible war and it's not working well for anybody. Because I mean, um, Van Cleef is a is basically on the side of Union, and he's the worst character in the whole movie. Really. Yes. So it's um, it doesn't take sides, even though historically it knows what side was a good side, what was a bad side, but it shows you that there was scumbags on both sides, really. Yes. It's an amazing film. It's one of those films that is pure cinema. Um, if anybody asks kind of what is pure cinema, it's good to bad and ugly is an example of it. It's just. An uh, audio and visual feast. Yes. And it's funny as hell. And Wallach. Yes. It's so over the top. Even Volante would be going, be going like, really? Really? Yes. <laughs> when they replace Volante with Wallach, and it's like, oh my god, uh, Leone does not let actors not chew the scenery. And for me, the Dolls trilogy is, I know you prefer the second one but for me it is kind of one of those rare trilogies that gets better in each installment yeah, yeah well personally I think the third one's objectively better yeah but, but the second one's your one, favourite yeah. yeah I mean there's a difference there's always a difference that, like, you got favourites even if you yeah, know that they're sure. not now we go to Once Upon a Time in the West the epic the peak of Leone's career and yes in terms of um, everyone loving something they made this is um, pretty much, if you're a fan of like West, spaghetti westerns, this is the peak, this is the Mount Rushmore of movies, this is the creme de la creme. Yeah, this is the film that actually usurped The Good, The Bad and The Ugly as my favourite western of all time. I didn't think that would be possible, because for years, for some reason, once upon a time in the West was never on, certainly, British television. No. Good, the bad, and ugly always was. The Dollar trilogy was, and I'd read about Once Upon a Time in the West, but I'd never seen it. And then when I actually saw it, it was like, "Holy shit, this is even better!" Which I, yeah, I couldn't it, believe. I couldn't believe that was possible. Yeah, but the thing but, is, it didn't really come out on video in the like, mid nineties. Until yeah, then, it was because was... I remember BBC Two had a Western series, and one of the ones that were shown was Once Upon a Time in the West, which for me was the first time I'd ever even been aware that it was actually ever on television. Yeah, and that, it blew me away. I saw it in video. I just saw it in video with uh, panned and scanned. But even then, yeah. with panned and scanned, you could tell it was amazing. Even though yeah. you knew you weren't going to feel image, it was still an astonishing film. And yeah, because I'd read about you know the opening sequence, and you think, oh yeah, I'm sure it's not going to be that good. And of course, you see it, and it's like, holy shit! <laughs> that just first ten minutes, first fifteen minutes. Yeah. You could just stop the film there and it would be like one of the greatest films of all time. Yeah, you put three too many. Yeah, it's <laughs> just too, the banter. Too again, yeah. the banter in this film is just amazing. Yeah, it's the coolest Charles Bronson's ever been. Yeah. Really. You know. Who is just this enigma. Yeah. He's not like a real person, he's just, but he's amazing. And, and of course, the Henry Fonda introduction is. Yeah. <laughs> what a way to mess an audience. It's just like classic scene after classic scene after classic scene, but the difference is this isn't a 90 minute film, this is 165 or whatever it is, and it's just classic scene stacked together. And but imagine the audience seeing that film when he saw the, the mob and massacre, then Henry Fonda shows up and shoots a kid. Yeah. That one must have been pretty. Because again, that's what Leone wanted. He wanted the camera to come round and everybody to go, holy shit, that's Henry Fonda. Yeah. And Henry Fonda plays a total scumbag in this one. Because yep. it's Henry Fonda, you respond to him when you follow his path, but he is one of the worst characters you could ever be. 
he's such an evil bastard, really. Yeah. And again, there were stories that Henry Fonda was going to do this droopy black moustache and he was going to do dark contact lenses and Loney said, no, I want your blue eyes, I want you clean shaven, I want yeah. people to go, that's Henry Fonda and he's just shot a kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's perfect. Then you've Jason Robards coming in. It's, yeah, he's never been better. Yeah, he is... I mean, the thing is, um, Charles Bronson's never been better, but he's never, that, he's never been that good, generally. But yeah. Robards is always good. Yeah. And seeing him, one of his peak performances, playing basically a caricature, but he's yeah. so good and he's so moving. He's the human heart of the film, ultimately. Yeah. He's the one that you actually care about, even though he's a bandit. He's just like... Yeah, he is a bad man who kills people, but... He has a soul. Yeah. He knows, like... He understands that the world's moving on and he doesn't have a place in it. He's not, like, yeah. really horrible compared to other people. He's just, like... He doesn't like the law, really. And yeah. it's just... And spoiler alert, when he actually dies, you are upset about it. Yeah, because he's the Which human... isn't always the case in films and westerns. Yeah, because the funny is, Claudia Cardinale was meant to be the human character, and she's good, but she's as distant as Charles Bronson in some ways. Yeah. And the, the person that really, you really do care about is Jason Robards. Yeah. I mean, this film is essentially the end of the West. Yeah. The end of the Western. All these characters, well, perhaps not Claudia Cardinale, but the rest of the characters, they know they're ha- they've got no place for them anymore. They know that it's the end of an era. Even Henry Fonda, you know, he tries to become a businessman. You know, Charles Bronson says, you know, you found out you're just a man. Yeah. And, and then Charles Bronson goes, an ancient race, which yeah. doesn't make any sense, but it's somehow really, really moving. Yeah. So they all yeah. know they don't really have a place in this world anymore. Yeah, at the point, uh, we would tell me who you are at the point of dying. Yeah, that's another great line. Which, of course, John Carpenter yes. riffed on in Salt and Salt. 13, yes. which is another one of my favourite films. So Yes. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the dialogue's amazing, and some of the set pieces are stunning, and the, the bit where, where, where Bronson keeps on killing the guys trying to kill Fonda. Yeah, because no one gets to kill him but me. It's like that's such a brutal line, and it's like yeah, because Claudia Cardinale is like, I can't believe you saved his life, and it's like, no, I didn't let them kill him, and that's not the same thing. Yeah, and then she suddenly realizes it's like yeah, yeah he's and the harmonica thing is this. It's almost ha- most of his character is just this harmonica playing, and yeah, and the reveal of that is just mind blowing. It's just amazing. Yeah, well, what actually happened? Again, it's yeah. sort, of, sort of like the kind of, kind of Mortimer thing is. Yes. There's an emotional yeah, a couple reason. of flashbacks. Yeah, and you get when you get the reason, it's like, yeah, that that motivates him. That's why he's doing it. You can understand entirely why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah, the first time I saw it, and you, you get the reveal, it was just like that is next level. Plus, it takes place. The reveal takes place in Monument Valley. Yeah, which is quite a stunner place to actually have our. Yeah, which was previously owned by John Ford, but not anymore. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, no, and it, it's just like scene after scene of iconography. But the, the, the first scene where we have Robards meets Bronson in the wash house and they're doing the harmonica thing, yeah, it's just stunning. Yeah. It just. Attention to detail, attention to music, and just have, have Robards menace this other guy who has got a gun, and it's just wonderful. That's, that's where, you, where you really start to adore Robards' character, because. Yeah. He's threatening, but he's funny with it and he's reasonable with it. He's not going to kill you because you're in a bar or anything. No, he's kill not you gonna, reason. Yeah, he's not going to kill you out of sadistic reasons like so many other Looney characters would. Yeah, no, um, I mean, it's like, for him, it's business, really. He's a businessman, yeah. ultimately. He's he's going to take do jobs, he's going to rob a bank, but that's it. He's not going to do other stuff to civilians. It's not really in yeah. his way. Well, Fonda I, would do anything to anybody. Yeah. He even kicks away crutches at one point. That's how much of a bad he is. <laughs> yeah, but the guy was annoying. Yeah. I mean, he had it coming. And He uh, shoots a kid and kicks crutches off of somebody. I mean, how much worse does it get? Yeah. But also, uh, we don't know, he says you, you can't trust a man who has both a belt and... 
Yeah, in places. Yeah, yeah and yeah, he's he's such an evil scumbag. It's it's so enjoyable to see him die. Yeah, and obviously Leone's shot composition, his use of the frame, is yeah. just amazing. Um, nobody got closer close-ups of eyes. <laughs> the camera Ever. always goes in and goes in and goes in and just continues <laughs> until. Yeah. yeah, I mean, where really did they get in? Jack yeah. Elam. I mean, no one shot Jack Elam. The way they only shot him, yeah. you know. The way the titles are incorporated into the action and the, the battle opening ten minutes is amazing. The music, with just yeah. the guy the, crack uh, his knuckles. Yeah, and the just the different sounds of the station. Yeah, you know. I mean, Clint Eastwood always said, you know, because he kind of grew up with the TV shooting and you know was a big fan of Don Siegel and more kind of workman like. Clint Eastwood never kind of understood the, or never kind of got. The whole long, long scenes and long things, you know. If that had been made by an American director, the intro would have been like two minutes. But yeah. again, Leone just building atmosphere, elongating time. It's just an absolute joy. Yeah, but he's operatic. That's what he's about. I mean, it's not about. I mean, if you look at Argento later, Argento took a lot from Leone. Like, the yeah. plot's the plot. The plot's not the reason for making the film. No. The plot's just there to. When you look at something like Inferno, there's like. A, plot that's written in the back of a postcard really ultimately for like you can do it in yeah. 10 minutes but it's about the sequences Suspiria is the same and that all came from Leone because we look at Good and Bad and Ugly that could have been like a could have taken an hour to tell yeah three guys want some gold yeah I mean it's simple enough but it's how it's told is the big thing that's the reason for watching it and this one it's a guy who wants to land for the railroad. That's it. That's the whole plot. It's, yeah. You literally could tell in five minutes this one. But no, you get the whole thing and you get this whole back flashback and you get the the greedy um, guy who's dying but he still wants to reach the coast. And yeah. he's... I mean, again, it's another long film that feels short, which again, not everybody can do. I haven't even talked about my favourite bits. is a bit where uh, Robards rescues Bronson on the train. Yeah. But he's going over the roof, and yes. it's just amazing. It's just this great sense of atmosphere, like he's taking these guys out. An interesting use of a boot. I know it's wonderful. <laughs> Which again, the first time I saw that, I just was wow. amazing. <laughs> just puts a smile on your face. Yeah, I mean it's just a wonderful film, and it's just the atmosphere. So moving, you just enjoy being in that world for three hours, and once it's over, yeah. it's like it's kind of sad. It's still over because you kind of want to watch it again and. When I got my projector, it was the first film that I watched on it. Yeah. I've seen this multiple times. I watch it every so often. It's one of those ones you want to watch when you want to get... Um, remember how great cinema is. It's one of the films that... Yeah. Well, in the first film of the, each year, I always try and get a special film, a film I love. So it's not like yeah. a, just something. I mean, I've watched Sansa Leal, I've watched Sunrise. And one year I watched Once Upon a Time in the West as my first film of the year. Because it's... Yeah, I mean... It is in the discussion for my favourite film of all time. Yeah. I don't even have a favourite film of all time. I've just given up on that. I've just got favourite directors, lots of films. It's like my favourite thousand films of all time. It's not... Well, when people ask me, it's, it's usually about half a dozen. And that's certainly one of them. Yeah. Even though I came to it late because I didn't see it yeah. until a bit later, obviously. Because like I said, I've seen Good, the Bad and the Ugly 50 times before I probably saw Once Upon a Time in the West, but... Probably, Amazingly, Leone still managed to better himself. Yeah. A few people ask me my favourite film. I always try and find something of someone really obscure to be annoying. So they Exorcist can see. Two. <laughs> I try and best on film or something, so they're like, <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> I've never heard of that one. Ah, screw you. Yes. I'm awful. I mean, I'm being honest, but I'm also. Yeah. I'm also being a bit of a dick. <laughs> never. Yeah, imagine that with me. I mean, astonishing. Yeah. Seems so out of character. Okay, when I duck you, sucker. Or yes, Crystal or Dynamite. Crystal Dynamite. Or Once Upon a Time in the, the Revolution. Yep. Are you going to see Mexico Which... there? Sorry? Are you going to see Mexico there? I almost said Mexico, but not That's quite. That's a different film. Not as yes, good. Yes, in, in the Midlands. <laughs> yep. I think this is the, the Leone film that probably is or has been the most underrated, but I think it was probably because it was underseen. 
certainly yeah. in its proper version because again like quite a lot of his films it was butchered on release and there was different versions going about but I actually think I've grown to love it a lot more just because I've seen it more times now yeah, it's also one of it's his, his mood towards more seriousness. He seems to, yeah. to care a lot more on this one. It's a bit of his tragedy in this one. It's not just laughed off. It starts off funny the way his other films are, but it gets darker as it goes on. And it's it, yeah, it's, it's a flashback back sequence as well. And there's all sorts of funny stuff, but it is more serious about how revolution can destroy people and how it's kind of a it's it's kind of the Upper classes praying the lower classes to make them go and die in a revolution. Yes, he's most overtly political one. All yeah. of his other films are kind of got politics underneath them, but this is probably his most overtly political one. Yeah, because he pretty much says it outright at some point. It's like, yeah, you all die, we die, and you all walk away. Yeah, I mean, Steiger says it's always the poor people that suffer through revolution. It's not. Yeah. They're the ones that always suffer. Yep. And it is, it's an, I mean, it's, it's, it's always is more flawed in some of their films because there is a kind of balance between the first half and the second half. Yeah. But, that's a minor flaw. That's like... Yes. It's not Plus, amazing. Rod Steiger's performance at times is a bit, what's the word? But once you like. Yeah, but even more so. I mean, it's, I don't know again whether he tried to get Steiger down a bit. Apparently <laughs> Apparently the trouble was the first half of the shoot and then they kind of worked it out. Yeah. Like, I think it took a while for them to get a, get a working relationship. But then Steiger loved him after that once he realised what he was doing and once they worked it out how he talked to each other I think it was fine. But I think the yeah. first half it was kind of... Because again, Leone didn't speak that much English and would act stuff out. Yeah. As well, so... Yeah. But we also had another great James Coburn performance. Yes. In the 70s, because Coburn in the 70s was really cool. Coburn really had a soulness. Like, in the 60s, it was funny, but in the 70s, he would, life had hit him a bit more, so he was actually more soulful. I mean, it's not as yeah. good as his performance in Pat Garen, Billy Kid, which is one of my favourite oh, westerns. Cross of Iron. and Yeah, but... But this one's still damn good. This one's still... Yeah. I mean, he is a more ironic character, but you can tell the series is below it. Like, he knows... Like, he's hanging around Mexico, taking jobs, just to blow stuff up because he's so pissed off the world. He's just... Yes. He's kind of giving up, ultimately. Yeah, because he was involved with IRA, um, whereas Steiger doesn't want anything to do with the revolution. When he robs the bank, he thinks he's going to get money, even though it's full of prisoners, and he accidentally becomes, like, a hero of the revolution. But he doesn't want anything to do with it, whereas Coburn has been involved with one and knows kind of what happens. He understands what revolution is and what it takes and what happens and he understands the yeah. cost of it to people. Yeah, and it's really against this. If some people have a glamorous view of revolution, this is kind of... This, in some ways, is his most brutal film as far as mass killings. and Obviously, there's a scene in the Grotto, a massacre, which kind of hark- harkens back to a famous Italian massacre by the Nazis in World War Two. Um, which is a direct um, yep. reflection of that one. Because a lot of t- in the 60s when they were making it, in the early 70s, there was lots of revolution going on in Italy and Europe and calls for revolution. And it was all romantic and yeah. based on the idea of overturning things would be great. And he was like, no, this is a revolution. This is what it actually is. This is not yeah. a plaything. There's real consequences to this kind of violence that you're not you're ignoring. Yeah. You know? But it's very timely for now. Because there's lots of yeah. people talking about revolution, and it's like, it's not what you think it's going to be. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be horrible. You're going to, it's going to be very painful for lots of people. It's like, yeah. innocents die it, for no reason. Yeah, Eureka Mass as a cinema recently released a really nice edition of it, and hopefully it now will get seen a bit more. Because again, for years you couldn't really find it or see it in a proper version. Yeah. Plus, uh, the name Duck You Sucker really. And really makes it feel silly. Yeah. I mean, I much prefer the title Once Upon a Time in a Revolution. It feels much more like that's what it yeah. is. And that fits in with the other two films, the one before it and the one after it. Yeah. Um, but but the, the rest of some amazing stuff, especially when his family, when his family gets killed. It's yeah. like, because you get used to these characters. 
the characters that first had to film, they're all around Rod Stegg, he's always interacting with them, he's always abusing them a little bit as a father, but he's always their dad and their yeah. comrade, and he's looking after them, he's helped them survive in Mexico. It can be a bit over the top sometimes, but you can tell he cares for them. Yeah. He does care. And then they're about to go somewhere safe, and that place gets raided and they'll die, and it's a massacre, and it's really yeah. horrific, and it's like a, a real gut print in the movie. Because you've just seen Steiger and Coburn do something really heroic, and then that happens, and it just undercuts it. Yeah. And the yeah, rest of the like... movie after that is just pretty much doer. Yeah, because it's like, you know, they're aware there's a price that has to be paid, and yeah, a price I mean, that always will be paid. Yeah, because the, the tone shifts from action-adventure to tragedy at that point. It's like, yeah. at that point, they're pretty much going to try and kill as many of these bastards as possible. Yeah. You know, and, um, that's what I like about the film. It takes that chance and really shifts in a way that you do not expect, because it's just like... Uh, yes. You don't expect that in a Looney film. You don't expect it to go that dark. Really. Yeah, and it goes very dark. Yeah. Like I said, it's probably his darkest, most brutal film yeah. in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the guy that is in the contact who thinks that the leader's revolution turned out to be a traitor. And then um, they kill the president because they, they end up in his train, they end up killing him. But it doesn't matter because there's still lots of yeah. people chasing them and it's, it's still, it's like, if we were, why does it matter? It's, it's a post World Punch movie where it's why does it all matter? It's yeah. very much a 70s movie where idealism's gone. And again, there's themes of torture and collaboration and betrayal. Yeah. And, the funny thing was, I think to... this film looked like a 60s film, but it was really a 70s film. And it was a confusion because, yeah. for the publicity, it's like, very much a 60s film, it's what you've seen before. But then when you see a film, it's really not it's something no. very much more akin to the 70s. So the identity problem by selling it is something that really wasn't. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I don't think it did that well. No, I think it did okay, but not great. I think it was one of those ones it made its money back, it was an epic film, but it wasn't a film that made Leone the hottest thing, but he's still a known figure after that as well. It was like, yeah. he, still could, he was getting offered stuff like Godfather and he was yes. turning it down. I would prefer to see Leone's Godfather. Of course you would. Yeah, I'm one of those people that isn't a huge fan of the Godfather. I know that's sacrilege, but... Yeah, it, is. it is. I think Leone's, sac- Leone's sacrilege. Leone's Godfather would be interesting. I'd rather not see that. I like what's <laughs> there. It's best of a Godfather too. Now Leone took a, a breather for a while, for like, what, a decade? Yeah, 13 years or something. It wasn't... Really? I mean, it was... 70, 71 to 84. Wow. Obviously, it was making it before 84, but... Yeah, because I mean, it must have been a couple of years because it was a yeah. epic film. But yeah, he was trying to get films made and it wasn't working for him. And the weird thing was, he got that made after Heaven's Gate, after the crash of the tour, and he was a big tour. But he couldn't yeah. get anything film made during the peak of the tours, which is really weird, because that's when you think you'd get something made. But yeah. never... It's because his films were always getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. But yeah, but he, he got it, eventually got once upon a time American made with De Niro. And this is one of De Niro's final great parts. This is De Niro just before the inevitable happened and he became shit. <laughs> well, I do we better go before that, but But you know, the the, the after Once Upon a Time America it started. It was a decade-long process that started there yes. that went on for... And then after Heat and Casino, it really started. Yeah, that's the Cut off mid-90s, point. that's pretty much. Yeah, there's flickers before that, but after, pretty much after Heat, it was like, I've done enough. I don't need to act anymore. Yeah. So it would be fair to say Once Upon a Time in America is another epic. I think that might be an understatement. Yeah, um, it's epic of epics. Yes, over four hours again, butchered in its first release. Took some time to actually get a final yeah. um, cut of the four hour version. Yeah, it's always like Leone said three hours is a bit too short for a film. It's, it's child's play. Yes. It's, it's nothing. I can do four quite easily. Give me five I mean, if you want. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I remember when the final four hour cut emerged to being on television, but they showed it over two nights, which yeah. was a bit bizarre. You know, I saw it in video. I bought the video before it was shown on TV. So you could buy in video in the early 90s or late 80s. It was one of those ones that it was one of my first things with Leone, and it was just like, wow, this is amazing. This is real cinema. This is something that's ambitious and yeah, beautiful and moving. Even though the characters are despicable, you're still moved by the music and the atmosphere, and you're seeing a life unfold in all yeah, the things from, made. From being kids to, again, um, betrayal and all of that kind of thing, which obviously runs through all Leone's films, as we mentioned. Yeah, but like in uh, what's put him in the revolution, the betrayals mean more now. It's like yeah. these betrayals hurt. It's not people. just for black comedy or sadism. Yeah, or... yeah the, the, the betrayals cause damage. I mean, it starts off with the betrayal pretty much with um, a lot of people getting beaten up, and you see, you know it's going to end bad. <laughs> like from the start, yeah. it's like this is not a film that's going to be happy go lucky. It's just like you're starting off seeing people beaten to a pulp and shot in the face. Yes. And, I mean, I would say it's it's probably the other Loney film that I don't watch the most. Um, obviously, something to do with its runtime. Um, but again, like you say, the characters aren't particularly likable. I mean, even obviously Robert De Niro, there's a famous rape sequence, um, yeah. which is somewhat jarring. It takes a left turn from this romantic, I've opened this whole restaurant for just the two of us to turning yeah. into a rape in a car. Um but I think it shows you his mentality. There's yeah. something off for him. Even though there was a good side to him, there's also a really horrific side. that's the gangster side that's damaged, yeah. really. So, I mean, that's kind of crossover from the other side of him that was... They did have some idealism to the side that's really... Yeah. Deserves what he gets. I mean, he yeah. kind of deserves what he gets. Yeah. That's the big joke about the film. Is like It's so moving, but also, do you know what kind of gets... He deserves it. <laughs> yeah. Really. So, I mean, personally for me, I do find I'm a little bit detached more from these characters compared with other Leone characters that I absolutely love and root for. Um, but it's obviously still a great film. Yeah. I am more attached to them than you are, ultimately, because I was one of the early Leone films and yeah. the early scenes really got me with the kids, them as kids and you're seeing them who they are, you see them the good side or bad side, you see them the circumstances of why they became what they became because they were there under bad circumstances, they were trying to make a living, they were trying to yeah. survive in the streets and then when you get into the into when they're in their twenties you see them become the utter thugs yeah. to survive and also because that's just the way society was but it's also they have pushing that as well yeah that's another great James Woods performance. Yeah, as the thuggish of the thugs. He's yes. he's the one who's smart enough to get out. He's the one who knows it's, this is not a good thing to be in long term. You have to try and find other ways. He's the one who makes contacts with the legitimate world that yeah. De Niro doesn't really ever care about. That. Yeah, because James Woods is another guy who had great 80s, um, but by the mid-90s um, was a shell of his former self. Yeah, and then... Yeah. <laughs> the De Niro John Voigt thing. Yes. It's like it's, John it, Voigt did of Anaconda, obviously, but Yeah. It's a highlight. Yeah. I was gonna say general, but you can go Anaconda <laughs> if you want. Fair enough. Pete uh, Williams and Danny Aiello and Yeah. But, but there's but a lot of interesting characters in it, but it is darker, but the Woods character is the, the scummiest one, but he's also the one yeah. who's you can't respect the fact he knows it's not a good thing to keep doing this. Like, it goes a bit far. I mean, he he realizes he has to cut loose in a way that is really brutal. Yeah. So he's not a nice guy, but he is the most Leone type character in a way. Yeah. He's the guy who would fit in the Leone film of the past, of the betrayals and things. Yes. I do just love the mood of the betrayal in the sense of. The new character has been away for decades and his life's been ruined and I'm coming back slowly re-emerging and his memories of the past and I'm trying to come to terms with the past. 
I guess yeah. we're moving. I think the final scene with him in Woods is terrific as they finally face off and then Neil yes. says, Neil rejects the story and says another story of what it really was and certain he's not going to help Woods at all. And it's... Yeah. There's lots if of only, stuff that's really moving. Yeah, if only it was done in a graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Check his body. <laughs> but, yes. but you guys put a trash can. That's not bad. Yes. Yeah. But I think a lot of it's really moving. But I think one of the problems with the film actually is De Niro's character is more unsympathetic than the filmmakers realise. Yeah, that's, that's maybe a fair point. They're trying to make him sympathetic and he does do horrible things to show the dark side, but I think that rape scene was too dark, darker than they thought it was going to come across as. Yeah. And it does make you think you had it coming. At that point, you think you're, you're, you're sympathetic towards him as a kid and you, you sympathise with him because his love for his life sees him as a petty crook and isn't going to go with him. And that's because of his lack of ambition in life and it's his own fault and a lot of stuff is his fault. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's some there's some pushback to the character. I think it's a fascinating character because as a character who isn't going to go ahead and do great things, he's going to be the loser of everything. Yeah. And the, the dialogue would suggest that even he knew that, that he was not the guy who was going to jump ahead and do stuff, great stuff. So yeah. I guess it's a very moving film about, about a loser, but he's also yeah. a bit reptilian. I think that's summed up fairly well, and that's probably why, for me, I don't engage with those characters as much as other Leone characters. Yeah, and for me, it's still one of my favourite films. It's like yeah. one of those ones that's like, despite the fact the character is that, I think the failure is very moving. Yeah. And even the darkness of him, I actually find really interesting. But I do think he keeps what he got. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it interesting to me because he deserved it. <laughs> yes. And I just think it's really, really moving because the music. Which, should we talk about the music then? Since Leone and Morricone is the music, it's the. It's yes, it's one films. of the, the great collaborations between filmmaker and composer in cinema history. Probably arguably the best. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd rate this higher than Hitchcock and Herman. I guess it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you hate Hitchcock, so... Yeah. I thought you were going to I mean, push back with the word hate. Well, I don't hate him. I just think he's the most <laughs> overrated filmmaker of all time. All right. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't imagine... Like I said before, Leone films are a visual and um, musical feast, and you can't imagine one with the other... Um, and Morricone just they just understood each other. Um, yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about the music in Once Upon a Time in the West, which the theme for Once Upon a Time in the West might be the greatest piece of music ever written, not to go into hyperbole. Um, there's such an emotional resonance with Morricone's music. You know, the crane shot over the station in Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. It's just amazing. Um yeah, there's not much more to say, apart from it's all great. Yeah, I mean, I think the music powers once pretend in America a lot. I think it relies on the music a lot to get yeah. across the characters, because the characters aren't that articulate. I think, and that's the thing about, about Lourdes films, is the characters aren't articulate their feelings, and the music can, does all the work for them. It tells yeah. you a lot about them, just the music and the shots, rather than what they're saying. And like you've said, you know, Morricone, sorry, Leone is pure theatre, pure opera. His films aren't realistic. His films are pure myth and theatre and opera, and obviously the music just adds to that. Yeah, and it, it creates this mood that's something that would go, again, would go on a lot. Because Morricone did a lot of uh, jallies as well afterwards. Yeah. And that kind of an end, even though he didn't do all of them, I, a lot of people just ripped him off after that, because it was like, yeah. Morricone is obviously the most important Italian artist in cinema. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he's influenced so much in America and in the, in Europe. I mean, he had collaborators that played with him, 
you know, his teacher was Bruno Nicolai, who did a lot of great scores himself. But that Morricone kind of note that brings an emotional yeah. response when you hear it. There's just something about that, and he knew what that note was and how to bring out emotions in people just by that Morricone note. Yeah, it's funny because I was listening to some music from Untouchables a couple of days ago, and it's a very different film from what um, yeah. the only was doing. But you can still recognise instantly it was, was Morricone. Yeah. Instantly, just to be... He did the other tunes. It was just like, yeah, it's yeah. pure Morricone. It's, yeah, uh, and of course he's not a traditional composer. He does lots of kind of things that are dissonance, strange instruments, sounds, bizarre voices, but for some reason it just works. Yeah. I mean, look at his score for The Thing. John Carpenter's The yeah. Thing. It's very untypical of him, but it's a wonderful score. Yeah. And it's just so, it adds so much to that atmosphere of dread and horror. Yeah. In a way, a traditional score really wouldn't. Yeah, Morricone was amazing and Leone was amazing and together they were double amazing. Oh, super amazing. <laughs> super inf- amazing. Infinity amazing. Yes. Yeah. Plus one. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Leone doesn't have a huge body of work, like I said before, like Tarkovsky, but um, people have been paying homage to him or ripping him off for years. I mean, obviously, he was influenced by the American Westerns. He was influenced by Bud Bedeker, especially. He mentioned him um, in his Westerns, Randolph Scott. Um, but he, for me, the, Ameri- the Western is an American thing. But then Leone managed to make westerns that were better than all the American westerns just by bringing them all together. You know, obviously when they were writing Once Upon a Time in the West, Argento and Bertolucci and him sat in a villa and just watched lots of westerns. Um, But then took elements of Shane and High Noon and various other things and just made it better. Yeah, made it their thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think also the thing about Leone is how well you pace a film. Yeah. You always forget about because. You think you think he's you also in the long shots, the slow movements, but he knew actually how he but he had to pace it up to keep your interest, and then you yeah. can go back to that. And there's always varying of types of scenes throughout the films, which no one ever brings up because I, everyone seems to think he did the same scene again and again and again, and that was the film. And it's not really he paced it really well. Yeah. He different types of scenes in every film just to make you interested. He wasn't just doing. The same old thing. Every film was a bit different. He was to keep himself interested. I think yeah. editing is something that I think people forget about how well edited his films actually are and how precise they were and how carefully edited he was and how they are mixed with music yeah. very carefully. Well, the, the trio standoff of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, the way that's edited with close-ups of hands and guns and belts and eyes and fit. I mean, it's and it, how that goes with the music. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, but the only you always think of the slow eyes and things. You don't really think yeah. of how fast it can be and how well edited some of the technical sequences were as well, and how different yeah. all that stuff was. It's like his films were a lot more layered visually, and also with the soundtrack beyond work, only just the sound effects yeah. and things. They created a world that was way more complicated than his reputation gets yeah. into. And again, these films are more political than people think they are. And again, it is a gift to make a long film seem short. Yep. There's plenty of people who repeatedly don't learn that lesson. Um, are you going to do a Tarantino bash now? Yeah, Tarantino specifically. <laughs> um, who makes films them, as, you're going to subtly suggest them. Who makes films as long as Once Upon a Time in the West, but they really should be 90 minutes instead of 160 because he's never actually learned how to make a long film seem short. His long films seem long, too long. Um, Yeah, I think Leone, like you say, in some way is actually underrated. Yeah. As daft as that sounds. Um, Because of his films, I think, were deeper than people give him credit for. I think he's similar to Austin Mills in that way, that um, everyone knows he's a genius, but no one knows how he's a genius. Ultimately, it's like, it takes effort to talk about him. In a way, it's hard to talk about him or Wells, that is talking about Hitchcock, where Hitchcock's style was so on the surface. It's yeah. easy to understand. They're more, these directors are more nuanced in how they used editing, how they used visuals, how they used music, and yeah. it takes more work for critics to talk about them. 
Yeah. And Leone's shot compositions right up there with Kurosawa and Kubrick and Wells as well. Yeah. And Kubrick's the other one that his films are more than newer ones that people let on. Just those yeah, well, Kubrick, um, the scene in Barry Lyndon in the stable, the standoff, was apparently a tribute to um, Leone because that scene wasn't in the book. And Kubrick was talking to Leone about how he uses music yeah. and matching it with the action. Yeah, um, that's a great sequence. So yeah. really tense and really moving. I should say on most of the Le- the Leone releases, if you get a commentary with Christopher Frailing, who obviously was his biographer, Christopher Frailing's commentaries are really excellent. Yeah, and uh, there's Alex Cox stuff and John Carpenter talking yeah. about what's playing West as well. The only person you find in these documentaries is stuff you shouldn't bother listening to is Richard Shittle. Who's a, a, yes. a, a Clint Eastwood hack? Basically, he loves Eastwood, yeah. and he's not very interesting. So don't bother with that stuff. It's not. It's not good. Yeah. It's very patronising Chris- towards Leone. He doesn't understand Leone, and it's like yeah. it's a waste of time. But, but just anyway, freely now, Alex Cox. It's going to be good. Yeah, stick with him. They're proper fans. Yes. Find a good way where it's critical as well, but they're respectful and they're interesting. Yeah. And Christopher Freeling has an amazing poster collection. <laughs> oh, that's good. Of Italian westerns. Yep. So as that's us then with the, or Sergio Leone. We, we promised you uh, last time we mentioned we we're going to do another direct. We promised it would be someone really good, and we've got someone else really good coming up uh, um, yes. early part of next year. So we've, we do have some interesting people to talk about. But that's us for this year. This is us. Where yes, what a year it's been. Yeah. I've, I've barely left my house. It's been amazing. I've, the series has been amazing. Like, yes. You know, um, looking around the same place for a whole year is just stunning. Yes. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. So after my little wine there. Let's... Let us know in the comments below what your favourite Sergio Leone film is. Yep. And why. And if you've seen Closest of Roads, please tell us about it. Yes. Because we want to know. Apologies to all you Colossus of Roads fans out there. But... We just haven't seen it. <laughs> it's hard to find. I don't know where you could find a copy of this thing. Yes. But, um, so that's us for now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>